Well, like I said, the, the topic for tonight is the hermeneutics of the law. And um, just starting with that first word, hermeneutics, I'm sure many of you that have attended some of the other sessions are pretty familiar with what the word hermeneutics means, but hermeneutics is just the, the science or the practice of interpretation. So the, the interpretation of the law. There's been some other, some other modules that were taught, interpretation of the Gospels, I believe, was one that was recently taught. So tonight we're going to look at the hermeneutics of the law, what it means to interpret the law. Um, before we go there, I wanted to read to you a short excerpt from the book Pilgrim's Progress. And I trust that many of you are familiar with the book Pilgrim's Progress, and I hope it's been a blessing to your walk with the Lord like it's been a blessing to mine. Um, the author, John Bunyan, just if, you don't, if you're not familiar with him, he was a, a Puritan pastor that uh, spent 12 years, I believe it was, in prison for the, the crime of preaching the gospel um, in England. At that time, if you did not belong to the traditional church, you weren't allowed to preach to large groups. And John Bunyan just felt really compelled by the Lord that he needed to preach the word. And so he spent 12 years in prison because he wouldn't stop preaching. And in prison, he wrote his classic, which is The Pilgrim's Progress. And it's a, an allegorical story that traces the main character, Christian, as he goes from the city of destruction to the celestial city. And it's really a parable that shows us what our lives as believers is like going from destruction under God's wrath to going to salvation someday in the future, our salvation is now, but culminating in the future in the presence of God in heaven. But at any rate, throughout John Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, he has many excellent um, insights and excerpts. That, and I wanted to read you this one in preparation for our, our lecture on the hermeneutics of the law. So Christian, the main character, has just come out of the valley of the shadow of death, and he overtakes another man on his journey, also fleeing from God's wrath to the celestial city, and this man's name is Faithful. And Faithful begins sharing with Christians some of the struggles that he's had in his Christian journey. And uh, picking up in, in the book Pilgrim's Progress, this is Faithful speaking. He says, Now when I had climbed about halfway up the hill of difficulty, I looked behind and saw someone coming after me, swift as the wind. Soon he overtook me, just about the place where the arbor stands. That is the place, said Christian, where I sat down to rest, fell asleep, and lost my scroll. Dear brother, hear me out, Faithful urged. So soon as the man overtook me, without saying a word, he struck me and knocked me down unconscious. When I came to, I asked him why he had thus assaulted me. He said that it was because of my secret inclination to follow Adam the first, and with that he struck me with another deadly blow on the chest, and beat me down backward, and I lay at his feet as if I were dead. So when I came to, I cried to him for mercy. But he said, I do not know how to show mercy. And with that, he knocked me down again. He would have beaten me to death, except one came by and told him to stop. Who was it that told him to stop? Faithful went on. I did not recognize him at first, but as he went by, I saw the wounds in his hands and in his side. Then I concluded that he was our Lord, so I continued up the hill. Christian then explained, the man who overtook you was Moses. He spares no one, and he does not know how to show mercy to anyone who transgresses his law. I know that very well. It was not the first time that he had met with me. He was the one who came to me when I lived securely at home, and who told me he would burn my house over my head if I stayed there. And we will come back to this in our final section tonight, which is um, the, our second to final section, the application of the law. But I'd like if you could keep this, this image, this parable in your mind as we go, because what John Bunyan is trying to convey to us here is a theology of how the law works with grace, how the law works with the gospel in bringing us to Christ. It's very important and um, the culmination point, really, of our study tonight on the hermeneutics of the law. So the, the text that I wanted to, to build this off of this evening is from Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 20. This is the text that kind of gives us the flavor, puts us in the historical context of the law, the giving of the law. And Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 20 says this, 
On the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. I'd just like to just pause for a moment and um, say that this is such a powerful scene in the scriptures. I believe it was R.C. Sproul that said that when we read our Bibles, we should read our Bibles existentially, trying to put ourselves in that place and feel with our senses what's going on. And so when you think about Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai, just with this thunder and lightning and thick darkness, God's word is communicating to us that something very momentous is about to happen in Exodus 19 going forward, and that is the giving of the law, which is a huge turning point in the history of redemption. So just to pause there and and think about Yahweh descending on a mountain to give his prophet his law. What do we mean when we talk about the law? If we're going to properly interpret the law, we should have some idea of what it is that we're talking about. So how do we define the law? There are, there's many different ways that we could define the law. Even within scripture, there's a lot of different ways. If you, if you think about David, he talks about his love and his delight for the law. You think about James and he talks about the perfect law of liberty. You think about Paul and to Paul, he talks about the law as um, almost an antagonist that is uh, holding him down in sin. And we know that Paul says the law is, is good and it's pure, but um, Paul is really kind of deadlocked with the law in the gospel of, or not the God, in the epistle of Romans and Galatians. So what are we referring to when we speak about the law? Um, Merle Unger in his dictionary says that there are six distinctive uses of the term law in scripture. And, and I quote, that which is enacted by man, the law of Moses, the law of grace, the natural law written on the heart, God's will, and the kingdom rule of life, end quote. And I'm sure there will be other senses within scripture as well, but these are kind of six broad headers within scripture of when the, the word law is used in the Old Testament or New Testament of what it could be referring to. So which, which sense are we going to be diving into, Lord willing, tonight? And we would be diving into the second sense, which is the law of Moses, as you may have, have um, already guessed by now. And when we talk about the law of Moses, we're talking about, again, this has sort of a, of a range of meanings, but we're talking specifically about the 600 and so commandments that were given to Israel, but then in a more broad sense, talking about the first five books of the Old Testament, which are the books of Moses. So just as we, as we think about the law tonight, that's, that's really where our scope is at. How do we understand the first five books of the Bible? How do we understand the law of Moses? How do we understand the laws that were given to Israel? When we read through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, how do we understand that? Uh, the textbook for this course, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth, will be um, my primary source, but then some of the other sources uh, I have listed at the bottom of your outline that Matt handed out. Um, but just quoting from, from the textbook on this, this definition of the law, it Uh, The authors say, and I quote, it is used, one, in the plural to refer to the laws, those 600 plus specific commandments that the Israelites were expected to keep as evidence of their loyalty to God. And number two, in the singular, to refer to all of those laws collectively. And third, in the singular, to refer to the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy as the book of the law, end quote. So that's where we're going tonight in our definition of the law. Whenever we're studying a piece of literature um, or even a piece of music, a piece of artwork, in order to to properly interpret it, you really have to understand 
the context within which it is set. I don't know if you've ever seen sometimes those, those pictures that are kind of a mirage. And if you look at them, you can see it one way, but then if you look at it in a slightly different light or tilt it, it kind of takes on a new picture. It looks like a vase or it might look like an, an old woman. And it just depends on how you, you look at the picture. And um, now those are just gimmicks that, are, are, that we do for fun. But, um, but there's a very real possibility that if you're studying a portion of scripture, from the, long, the wrong framework or from the wrong angle that you could also interpret it wrongly. So it's, it's very key that whenever we come to any portion of scripture, whether it's the law, the history, the prophets, the gospels, apocalyptic literature, that we look at it through the, the correct framework, through the correct context within which it's given. So uh, we'll attempt to, to set that correct framework tonight going into our study of the law. So what was the occasion of the law? Why did God descend on Mount Sinai and give these uh, 600 some laws to this new formed nation of Israel just coming fresh out of slavery? Well, as I alluded to already, this was given in the context of Israel coming right out of Exodus. And uh, quoting from our textbook, here were people who for hundreds of years had known only slavery and Egyptian culture, and now God was about to constitute them into a totally new people on the face of the earth. As I, as I read that quote, it really struck me that, wow, that, that's a point that I have not taken into consideration when interpreting the law, just how, how important that background was of slavery in Egypt for, for what was going on in the people's mind as, as Moses received the law from God and then gave it to them. Again, think about this existentially. Just imagine yourself living in Egypt as a slave. You've been working for the pharaohs for as long as you can remember, and so has your father and your grandfather and your great-grandfather, and all you've ever known in the land of Egypt is oppression, hard labor, idolatry surrounding you on every side, and then suddenly God in your lifetime, for some inexplicable reason to you, decides this is the moment to act. And he sends Moses and Aaron. You see the ten plagues fall upon Egypt and you're just miraculously delivered out of this land of slavery and brought to this mountain, Mount Sinai. And now God is going to reveal to you and everyone else in your nation what it means to be a follower of Yahweh. And that's, that kind of gives us a glimpse of what the context is for the people as they're standing before Mount Sinai. Because at this point, to some degree, their understanding of who Yahweh is, is sort of foggy. Now, they've, they've heard about him probably through the oral traditions passed down through the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, what they knew and passed down. Um, they, they've obviously heard about him through Moses and, and seen his work through the signs, but who is this God who has just brought us out of Egypt? And so part of the reason why Yahweh is giving these laws is to reveal himself to Israel. This is who I am. This is what um, following me is all about. Listen to this quote from Merle Unger's Bible Dictionary again on the religion in Egypt. The Egyptian religion was an utterly bewildering polytheistic conglomeration in which many deities of the earliest periods when each town had its own deity, were retained. Re, the sun god, was worshipped at Heliopolis. Osiris, god of the Nile, became the god of fertility. With the ascendancy of Thebes, the local god Ammon was elevated and eventually identified with Re under the compound Ammon Re. The moon also was worshipped as a god. Ptah, a god of Memphis, was known as great chief of artificers. It would be practically impossible to list all the gods sacred to Egyptians. Every object beheld, every phenomenon of nature was thought to possess a spirit that could choose its own form, occupying the body of a crocodile, a fish, a cow, a cat, etc. Hence, the Egyptians had numerous holy animals, principally the bull, the cow, the cat, the baboon, the jackal, and the crocodile. Some of the deities were composite with human bodies and animal heads. It goes on. Um, but just with that little bit of an insight, does that not add some light to even the Ten Commandments themselves. You shall not make for yourselves any graven images, anything that, um, that you would look at 
and like the golden cow and say, this is what your God is. Worship this. And so coming out of this context in Egypt where everything is a God, where it, a small g God, and where animals are thought to be divine, where you're worshiping everything, and then suddenly you're being called to worship Yahweh, who is not visible, who is a spirit, who is not part of the material world, but he's transcendent above the material world. And you begin to realize this is a completely different religion than what I've been exposed to in Egypt. There's no blending of Egyptian religion with Yahweh syncretism. Well, not only are they coming out of that context, but then also going into Canaan. We may be a little bit more familiar with what was going on in Canaan. If you've read your, um, your Old Testament, you're familiar with false gods like Baal and Ashtoreth and some of the Chemosh, some of the others. And, and you see a very similar thing to what's going on in Egypt, that they're worshiping false gods who are identified with natural things. So Baal was thought to be um, the one who rode on the thunder and rode on the lightning, um, brought fertility to the land. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, a very pagan idea that God is invested in the material universe, but one of the identifying marks of the true faith is that God is transcendent from it, that he created the world, but the world is not an extension of him. And so part of God giving the law at Mount Sinai is to correct that false Egyptian idolatry that's still carried over in the minds of the Israelites. And really, the history of the Old Testament is God's people struggling and relapsing over and over again into paganism, whether it's the Canaanite or the Egyptian-style idolatry, and the Lord through his prophets, through his law, calling them out again and again to worship of the one true God, Yahweh. And so this is the context that the law is given in. It's very countercultural to what the people of Israel had experienced in Egypt and even in Canaan. Well, another reason was that there was a necessity of a coherent national identity. And um, again, our textbook highlights this, this fact that um, God's people were being formed into a nation. Not only must they be formed into an army of warriors in order to conquer the land promised to their ancestors, but they must also be formed into a community that would be able to live together both during their time in the wilderness and eventually in the land itself. And uh, again, think about this, but you've got sort of a, a, a disaggregated group of tribes that all have a, their, their similarity is that they're Semitic, their similarity is that they're enslaved to the Egyptians, and that they're somehow tangentially related to this guy, Abraham. But these are, these are tribal groups, tribal families, and now the Lord is seeking to meld them into one nation that's going to go in and conquer the land of Canaan and become, it already is, but it evidence his nature as the promised land, the promised people of God in Israel. And so part of the, another purpose of the law in this context is to form them into a people. But then also, and probably most importantly, is that the Lord is establishing his covenant with them. He is giving them his promise that they will be his people and he will be their God. And so when we think about the law in its context, again, what is the occasion of the law? The occasion is coming out of Egypt as slaves. The occasion is being purged from idolatry. The occasion is being formed into a new people and then also realizing that they are the covenant people of God who are to reflect his character. And just by, by way of application in this, um, we can see God's love in giving the law for these purposes because this is part of God's plan of redemption. So if we think back to the fall in Genesis 3 and God promises that through the seed of the woman there's going to come a deliverer. And through the Old Testament we can trace God's plan through that seed. So first of all it's the seed of the woman and then it's the seed of Abraham. That promise is given to Abraham that through your seed all the nations will be blessed. And this is a continuation of that promise that God has not 
abandon his seat, his special people through whom salvation will come to the world, but that he is forming them into the covenant community that he wants them to be. And then later on, we see that the seed promise is given even a little bit narrower focus to the house of David. And David specifically will have a son um, who will be the Messiah. And so when God gives his law to Israel, this isn't just a, a detour from the plan of redemption. This is part of how within space and time he is executing that promise. And again, this is an area where Christianity really stands out as unique from, from, a lot of Christ, from a lot of false religions in the world. And many false religions and philosophies are content with sort of generic platitudes or things that could, could apply anywhere or are, um, are nonspecific. But part of what makes Christianity offensive to the pagan mind is that we say these things actually happened in history. God acted in space and time. There was a real garden where there lived a man and a woman who really fell. And God could give you the exact date and the exact time that that happened. There was a global flood that happened on a specific day. And there was a day that God descended on Mount Sinai and gave the law to his people because on another day he would descend in the form of the incarnate son of God and bring salvation to his people. So our faith is a historical faith and, um, and, and so many things bear that out. Archaeology um, is one of them, history, just evidence is all over the place. Um, but it's important to realize that this, this happened within space and time and it happened in a context for a reason. And we can take hope in that because within this event, we see God's love for us who are believers and who are now the covenant people of God through Jesus. So what is the, we talked about the definition of the law, the occasion of the law. What is the, the nature of the law? Uh, many, unfortunately, many through the Bible in a year reading programs have been shipwrecked in the book of Numbers or Leviticus, if we're being honest. I think we've all got off to a good start sometimes, got through Genesis, got through Exodus, but then come to Leviticus and Numbers and just, what am I reading? What, what, what is going on here? And so we can, we can understand this context, but still sort of be a little bit bewildered by how do these laws apply to me in my life um, as, a, as a believer now in Jesus and the new covenant? That's what I hope to address in, in this section here. What is the nature of the law? What is the, the structure of the law? As you're reading it, what should you be thinking about? Well, the Westminster Confession of Faith is, is really helpful on this. Um, I'll just read a little bit from, from this. Uh, God gave to Adam a law as a covenant of works by which he bound him and all his posterity to personal, entire, exact, and perpetual obedience. This law after his fall continued to be a perfect rule of righteousness and as such was delivered by God upon Mount Sinai in Ten Commandments and written in two tables, the first four commandments containing our duty towards God and the other six our duty to man. Besides this law commonly called moral, God was pleased to give to the people of Israel as a church under age ceremonial laws containing several typical ordinances partly of worship, prefiguring Christ, his graces, actions, sufferings, and benefits. To them also, as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws, which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any other, now further than the general equity thereof may require. End quote. And so um, that may sound a little bit antiquated, but uh, I would really commend the Westminster Confession to you. It, it uh, really is a succinct statement of theology and faith. And I found this, this section really helpful as I studied for this lecture. But what the, the confessors of, of this document are saying is that in the law, we see really three big breakdowns. So there's what we would call the moral law, and then there's the ceremonial law, and then there's the civil law, or what they call the judicial law. But it, it's the, the same idea. And this, the first time I, I heard of this, um, this distinction, it was really helpful to me because... That, that, that structure really helps just as you're reading through the Old Testament to, to, the Old Testament laws just to think, is this a moral law? Is this a ceremonial law? Is this a civil law? 
Now, some of them don't fit perfectly in one category, but in general, that's a really helpful way of thinking about it. And then, as we'll talk about in our application section, they, they apply to us as, as Christians in the New Covenant in different ways. So what do we mean by the moral law? Well, this would be epitomized in like the Ten Commandments. Uh, commands like don't murder, don't commit adultery, do not steal, uh, don't bear false testimony. These are moral commandments that, according to the, the, the Westminster um, authors, and I think they're right on this, were actually given to Adam. So from the creation of the world, people had the moral law written on their hearts. They knew what God's expectations were about morality. Cain, when he picked up whatever it was and killed Abel, he knew that he was sinning against God's moral law. He didn't need to have the tablets of stone to know that what he was doing was evil. But these, these moral laws are codified for us in the law of Moses. So the, the moral law, um, again, the Ten Commandments, think of that, but there's also others beyond the Ten Commandments within the five books of Moses. Well, then the civil law. What's the civil law? These are laws that pertain to Israel as being um, its own theocratic state. And by theocratic, we mean that it was ruled by God himself. Now, God ruled through intermediaries. He ruled through judges. He ruled eventually through kings. But the theocratic state was, was a very unique political entity in that it was submitted to Yahweh. This was Yahweh's country if you want to say it that way. And so there were laws that God gave to Moses that this is how this nation state is to be run, that there were specific punishments for crimes. There were cities of refuge, things like that. Just any law that would pertain to the government of the land, we would call civil law. And then the third category is a ceremonial law. So ceremonial laws would refer to things like the laws of purification, um, you, you read about things like um, emissions and men and women and how they had to spend time outside of the camp in order to be purified and then they could come back into the community. Or uh, laws of separation, like if you have leprosy or a skin disease. And laws of atonement, like in Leviticus 16, talking about the, the lamb that was the atoning sacrifice and the scapegoat that would go out into the wilderness and carry the people's sins out from them. So th those categories would fall under the ceremonial law. That distinction is really important, and especially as we get into our application later on, you'll see how. And then finally, when we see uh, in the final section the glory of the law in Jesus Christ, those distinctions really come to life. Um, another way of, of seeing a structure in the Old Testament law is through the covenant. And here I want to read to you from, from our textbook. I found this section really helpful on page 171. In Old Testament times, covenants were often given by an all-powerful suzerain, overlord, to a weaker dependent vassal or servant. My, my six-year-old daughter asked me, I think it was yesterday, she said, Dad, what does a covenant mean? And I don't know where she saw that, but um, a covenant is a promise that's made by God. Now, some theologians define it as a promise made in blood, that if, if the promise is broken, then blood needs to be shed, and, and I think that's valid as well. But in its basic form, it's a promise or an agreement. So in Old Testament times, covenants were agreements between an all-powerful suzerain or overlord to a weaker dependent vassal or servant. And here's where, where this is really helpful. The covenant format had six parts to it. Preamble, prologue, stipulations, witnesses, sanctions, and document clause. The preamble identified the parties to the agreement. I am the Lord your God, Exodus 22. While the prologue gave a brief history of how the parties became connected to one another. I brought you out of Egypt, Exodus 22. The stipulations, as we have noted, are the individual laws themselves. The witnesses are those who will enforce the covenant, the Lord himself, or sometimes heaven and earth. The sanctions are the blessings and curses that function as incentives for keeping the covenant, Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28 through 33. The document clause is the provision for regular review of the covenant so that it will not be forgotten, Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 19. So if you have read through the books of Moses and uh, 
this, at least to me, it really comes to life. It's like, okay, so now I understand why there's all these component parts when Moses gives the law. These are, these are evidences of, of this kind of a covenant where there's going to be a prologue. God's going to explain, this is where you came from. This is where I found you. This is what I've done for you. There's going to be stipulations, which are the laws. There's going to be witnesses. There's going to be curses and blessings. Without this framework, you can be tempted to read through it and just say, this is sort of a, a hodgepodge going on here. What's, what's all this stuff? How is it connected? But when you understand that the, the books of Moses are a covenant document where God is making a covenant with his people, and by looking at how covenant documents were structured in this time period, you understand this is exactly what's going on. God is issuing a legal document to his people and saying, I'm making a covenant with you. And uh, these are the blessings, these are the curses of that covenant. Um, interestingly, uh, just a, as by way of a tangent, um, recently archaeologists found what is called a curse tablet on Mount Ebal, which is in the book of Deuteronomy, I believe, in that account, where, if you remember the story, they were to go up on two mountains, I think it was Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and they were to recite the blessings of keeping the covenant on one, and they were to recite the curses of disobeying the covenant on the other. And um, contemporary scholars, in their great wisdom, have said that at this point in time, uh, the name of Yahweh was not even known, and that this story from the Pentateuch was just a later fabrication that was created after the exile to try to give the people of Israel sort of an identity after they came out of Babylon. Well, lo and behold, in 2020, they dig up a little tablet that says something to the effect of cursed, cursed by Yahweh are you. And using their radioactive dating, they date it right to the time of Joshua going into um, Israel. And so uncontestable proof that not only was the name of Yahweh known and written on this tablet that was buried in Mount Ebal for all of these hundreds and even thousands of years, but also that it was used on a curse tablet on Mount Ebal, which is where the covenant ceremony was ratified by Israel. And so just when I read that, I was, I was blown away. I was worshiping God. This is amazing that you would allow us to dig this little tiny piece of a tablet up and just reaffirm our faith once again and, and silence the scoffers once again who would mock your word. Um, so yeah, it, it just again, tangible. This stuff really happened. And it happened in space and time. So thinking of the structure of the law, civil, moral, and ceremonial, the law is a covenant, and it's got these six parts. I invite you to revisit your textbook and just look at that and maybe think about it a little deeper, um, especially if you're going through the law currently and see if you can identify where the preamble, the prologue, the stipulations, witnesses, sanctions, document clause are, and let that help your, your interpretation. Um, one final way that, that it's helpful to to categorize the laws is um, in two formats, and that is the apodictic laws and the causistic laws. And I have to confess, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing these correctly. I actually did a Google search to try to check my pronunciation, and apodictic, I think that's correct, correct, but they didn't have anything on Google for causistic laws. So uh, maybe if I'm wrong, Matt can pull me aside later. But um, but these, these are kind of two ways that the law is structured. So what do we mean by an apodictic law? Uh, in your textbook, page 176, very helpful. Um, quoting from Leviticus 19, 9 through 14, and I'll just read, read part of this. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it says, do not steal, do not lie, do not deceive one another, do not swear falsely by my name, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But fear your God. I am the Lord. Commands like these that begin with do or do not are what we call apodictic laws. They are direct commands, usually in the second person imperative, generally applicable, telling the Israelites the sort of things they are supposed to do to fulfill their part of the covenant with God. So these are just basically do and do not laws. And there's lots of them in the law of Moses. The second uh, format of law is causistic laws or case law. And this is like a scenario 
that happens. If any, this is from Deuteronomy 15, starting verse 12. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. And when you release them, do not send them away empty-handed. Supply them liberally from your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press. Give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. That is why I give you this command today. i uh, reading now from the authors of our textbook. The elements in a law like this are conditional. They describe certain conditions that may prevail in certain types of situations involving certain types of people, but not necessarily in every situation involving every person. The recipients of the law were expected to understand that they had broader implications. And that's the key point about case laws, is a case law is here's what you do if this situation happens. So one, one situation in the, the law is the guy's got a bull, and the bull is known for goring things. Well, if the bull gets out and gores somebody and kills them, then he's liable for that because he knew that this bull was the kind of bull that would go and gore somebody and he should have kept it fenced in. And so it would be, it would be a, a misapplication of case law to say, well, I've got a donkey that kicks, but because the donkey that kicks isn't mentioned in the law, I'm okay if that donkey goes out and kicks somebody and they die. No, the proper application of the case law would be to take the principle and say, okay, so anytime you have a potential hazard that you could control that would, um, would harm someone else, it's your responsibility to make sure that that hazard is controlled to the best of your, 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 your ability. So that's, that's how a case law would work. Um, so again, just thinking about the structure of the law, hopefully those three categories are helpful to you. And um, now we, we get to point four, which is the application of the law. And this is where, as New Testament believers, I think it, it becomes interesting and applicable to us. Uh, as the authors of our textbook note on page 170, in some sense, it's impossible for us to keep the law the same way as Israel did. We don't have a temple. There's no sacrificial system. And so there are, obviously, at the forefront, limitations to how we apply the law. But does the law still apply to us in some way in the new covenant as believers in Jesus? Uh, this is the position of the writers of our textbook. They say, we should assume, in fact, that none of its stipulations are binding on us unless they are renewed in the new covenant. I have to take exception with that. I think that's a little bit overstating the issue. So their, their view is, Unless the New Covenant specifically reiterates part of the law, then it doesn't apply to us anymore. Now, the New Testament does repeat all of the Ten Commandments with the exception of, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And, um, and so the moral law would definitely carry over. But, but is, that, is that sufficient? Is that what we are to view it as? That, hey, we can read the Old Covenant law for our interest but it doesn't really apply to us anymore unless it is specifically called out. I don't think so. Um, and I'll give you one passage of scripture to, uh, to look at, to sort of chew on, and you can come to your own conclusions. Um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 to 10, we find Paul using the law, and he's not using part of the moral law, he's actually using a case law. So if you look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 8 to 10, it says, Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things among you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do not we even more? So what Paul is actually doing is he's, he's reasoning from a case law into the new covenant and saying that you guys should provide for the material welfare of the apostles and by extension of your pastors, of your teachers, you should take care of them. And he's basing this, he says, not on human authority, he's basing it on the law of Moses. So, so how does 
the Old Testament law apply to us. I don't think it's sufficient to say, well, unless it's specifically restated, it doesn't apply. Um, but there, there are some things that we need to understand going forward. The first thing is, and again, this is where our, our threefold distinction, civil, moral, and ceremonial, really comes in handy. The first thing is that the ceremonial law, the primary purpose of that was to lead us to Christ. So if we look at Colossians 2, um, verses 16 and 17, these are the words of the Apostle Paul. He says, Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so if you look at these things, they're all parts of the ceremonial law. Paul is saying that, you know, don't, don't feel like you have to legalistically observe a new moon festival anymore, or that you have to only eat kosher food. You, you don't have to follow the dietary food laws anymore. And why is that? It's because these things are a shadow of what was to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So when we want to apply the ceremonial law, it is applied through Christ. Christ fulfills the ceremonial law. I love the way that Matthew Henry says it. Um, and if you don't read Matthew Henry, I would highly commend him to you. He's, he's really helpful. But Matthew Henry says, the ceremonial law is perfected in the gospel colors, not one tittle of that fails. Um, the way that I, I picture this is my daughters have these, these um, notepads that they got for Christmas, and they're, they're white, but you can kind of see like a sketch on them. They have different princesses and things like that. And then they have these water pens, and they, they fill up the water pen, and they start brushing over this white piece of paper with a water pen, and as the water hits the paper, all these colors just come out. And by the time they're done, it looks like they've painted this incredible painting when all they've done is just gone over it with water. And then it dries out and it turns white again and you can use it over and over again. But when Matthew Henry says the ceremonial law is perfected in the gospel colors, that's what comes into my mind. That it's like you had this, this sketch before Christ came where you, you sort of saw, okay, the ceremonial law it shows us about God's holiness. It shows us who God is. But, but where, where is this headed? And then you come into the New Covenant, and we'll get into this in our final section a little bit more, but suddenly, when the Gospel comes, when Jesus comes, it's like water on that piece of paper, and all the colors come to life, and you suddenly see, this is what the ceremonial law was pointing towards. It was pointing towards Christ and His work as a priest. It was pointing towards Christ and His work as a sacrificial lamb. It was pointing towards Christ, the one who is truly set apart as holy. It's pointing to Christ, the true Israel. And so the ceremonial law is meant to lead us to Christ. So is it binding on us? No, it's not binding on us because that would be going backwards in time. We're in Christ, and so we are purified in him. The moral law, as we said, is um, forever binding upon all people. And in, in the book of James chapter 2 and verse 8, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. Uh, Paul in Romans echoes this. He says in Romans 13, 8 through 9, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And every commandment are summed up in the, this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And obviously Paul is echoing the words of Christ here um, from the Gospels. But in both Paul and James and in Christ, they all reaffirm the moral law. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. These are still applicable laws, but they flow out of a heart that's been transformed by the gospel. They're not a grounds for justification, not the way that we attain favor with God. But as God's covenant people, they are to flow out of our heart in joyful obedience to him. Well, what about the civil law? So we said the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ. 
as we are in Christ, we are ceremonially clean before God, so we don't need to sacrifice lambs or not wear clothes of mixed garments. Um, the moral law, we said, is continually, continually binding upon us, um, but in a grace and spirit-empowered way. But what about the civil law? This one's a little bit um, more difficult. Um, and again, I'll refer to the Westminster Confession. I think this is a really good statement. It says, To them also, as a body politic, he gave sundry judicial laws, which expired together with the state of that people, not obliging any other now further than the general equity thereof may require. So we do not live in the Old Testament theocracy, but does that mean that God's civil laws don't apply anymore? Does it mean that we should not try to um, improve the morality of our nation? Does it mean that we shouldn't try to overturn things like abortion or um, homosexual marriage? Should we just live and let live? What are the confessors of the Westminster Confession saying here? What are they getting at? Um, the, the passage that they cite that I found helpful in, in interpreting um, what, they, what they mean by this is 1 Peter 2, verses 13 through 14. And as I meditated on this passage, I think I got at the heart of what these wise men were saying. And I think it's something that we, we all can agree with. Um, 1 Peter 2, verses 13 and 14. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor or the supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So I believe what the Westminster Confession is getting at here is any government that you are under currently is legitimate before God. Because Romans 13, right, says there's no authority except that which is given by God. So we don't have to think this government is not according to the law. Therefore, we shouldn't submit to it because it's not a pure government. No, every government that's been put in, in place in this season of time is under the Lord's providence. However, they say, accept what's useful for the general equity. So if we are in a position to influence our government we should by all means try to draw them as close as we can to what has been revealed to us as God's perfect legal standard. And so it is right for us to try to influence our countrymen to turn away from abortion, to turn away from gay marriage, to turn away from these things which are destructive to them individually, but also destructive to a society as a whole. But that does not mean that any state which is not theonomic at this point, like the state of Israel, is an illegitimate state. It'd be easy to jump to that conclusion, but the Lord says that he has put these institutions in place for this time. Now, eventually there will be a theocracy under King Jesus, and in that theocracy, God's law will perfectly rule, and all other governments will be illegitimate, and um, we'll get to that. So that's my two cents on the applicability of the civil law. But um, wiser men than me have hashed that out. Um, so the application of the law. The law does not justify, but it shows us the will of God and our need for Christ. And I think this is the key application of the law. The laws reveal God's character. And as God's character, his holiness is impressed upon us, we see that we are not worthy to stand before God. And so the law leads us to the necessity of a new covenant. And just in our, our last few remaining moments, um, point five, I'd like to talk about the main glory of the law, and that is that it leads us to Jesus Christ. Um, looking at Galatians 3, verse 24, Paul says, So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. How does the law lead us to Jesus? It's interesting that in the very first book of the New Testament, in Matthew, we find Jesus intentionally taking up the mantle of Moses as a lawgiver. Uh, what we see in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus goes up onto the mountain and he begins speaking like this. He says things like, you have heard that it was said of old, you shall not murder, dot, 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 but I say to you. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, 
dot, dot, dot. But I say to you, who is this man who thinks that he can quote Moses and then add another layer on top of that? He's the prophet that Moses spoke about, right? After me, there will become one, a prophet who's greater. And so Jesus takes on this mantle of the Mosaic law giver. So that's one way that Christ fulfills the law by becoming a new Moses who gives a new law. The law exposes our insufficiency and our need for a savior. And the three distinctions of the law each point us to Christ as our savior. So the moral law points us to Christ who is the only one to perfectly obey it and thus fulfill all righteousness on our behalf. In uh, the book of Matthew, as Jesus is about to be baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist protests, but Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. 2 Corinthians 5.21, I hope you have this one tattooed on your heart. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the, the point of the moral law was, first of all, to expose our own inadequacy, that we cannot measure up to it, and to lead us to a Savior, and to certify Jesus as that Savior because he's the only one who lived up to the perfect moral law without sin. And so what God does is he does the great exchange, which is at the heart of the gospel, which is why it's attacked so often. But he takes Christ's perfect righteousness and gives it to us and takes our sinfulness and places it on Christ. And Christ atones for our sinfulness on the cross. And so we have exchanged our sin for his glorious righteousness. And that's the only way we can be acceptable before God. The moral law points us to that. It points us to Christ the perfectly obedient Son of God. The ceremonial law points us to Christ as the one who is the perfect sin sacrifice and made us clean and acceptable to enter God's presence. So John the Baptist saw it early um, in, in the first chapter of John. He says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Book of Hebrews capitalizes on this theme, and every priest stands daily at his service, this is from Hebrews 10, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being Sanctified. That verse 14 is so encouraging to me as a Christian because what it means is that Jesus' death on the, on the cross made us pure, a one-time act, even as we're being sanctified. So we continue the fight with sin daily, but our justification before God is not in question because Jesus offered himself in a one-time historical act on the cross as the Lamb of God. So the entire ceremonial law, all the blood of the animals that were slain, all of it points to that one act of Jesus on the cross, the Lamb of God. The judicial law points us to Christ as king and ruler over his universal domain. So we know that Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he will be the king over all things. He is the king now, but everything will bow the knee to him. Where the theocratic state under Moses ultimately fell short, culminated in apostasy and ex exile, the theocratic kingdom under Christ will not fail, but will exist forever. Just wanted to close by reading Psalm 110. Um, Psalm 110 1 is actually the most quoted Old Testament verse in the New Testament. And this is a psalm that celebrates the kingship of Christ and his victory over the nations. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Let's close in prayer.